What's up, dude? Um, not much. Thanks for being on the podcast. Yes, sir. Um, you do kind of look like Patrick Swayze walking in here. Jimmy was like, yo. <laughs> so you get Patrick Swayze, and then who is the other one? Uh, Jason Bateman. Okay. So but what's funny about Jason Bateman is I've only ever gotten it at Starbucks's. Uh -huh. One was in Washington, and one was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah. There you go. Random. People working at Starbucks think I'm Jason Bateman. There you go. Apparently. It's Starbucks. It, why is it always like the coffee shop people or like the restaurant people that do that? It's like they're always the people like, hey, do you know you look like you're in line at Chipotle? And like so the person good. serving guac's like, hey, do you know you look like so-and-so? So Do you want extra cheese with that? <laughs> you, and you're like, um, thanks. Like, it, it, I don't yeah. know if it's a compliment or cool, but yeah. There's some people, man, that are like doppelgangers. because they're so probably, bored with their probably. repetition. Or they just see different people every day. Yeah. Just random people walk in the door. Yeah, you probably just have to figure that one out for yourself. So welcome to the Bison Podcast, guys. My name is Dakota. Uh, this is my good friend, Elliot. Uh, actually, this podcast is named after Elliot because he has a really big bison tattoo on his thigh. Um, you guys know the story. This this podcast is about to come up. So have Elliot on board. Elliot's 26? 26, 26. 26 years old, uh, super successful. Um, are you a millionaire yet? Mm, I haven't checked. Okay, fair enough. Get getting there, like approaching that. But um, Elliot's filling in for uh, a guest that that uh, couldn't make it last minute. So I appreciate you you doing that. Um, Elliot adds a lot of value to my life. Like he's uh, he's the man, and uh, grateful to have him in my life. So, um, dude, tell us um, tell us your story. So you were just telling us in high school you were a theater kid, and you know, kind of go from there. Like so, you yeah, were eighteen. Well, 19 years old in high school? Yeah, I was right whenever I went into high school, like as I like I quit all the sports, mm -hmm. that's what I transitioned to of just like hanging out with more people doing theater than like sporting. And um but no, I it, high school is actually like a really influential part of my life just cuz and I know like that's like typical for most people, mm -hmm. but it was like the hardships that I had to go through, I felt were, I don't know, like definitely like molded me to be the person who I needed to be mm -hmm. to take EcoShield seriously. Sure. What kind of, um, what kind of life lessons do you feel like you learned or picked up from high school or, um, or just like through the things that you went through in high school? You know, honestly, like there was like, I was between schools. Mm -hmm. So something that I learned was like, if they want to be in your like if like friends and and family want to be in your life mm -hmm. they will reach out to you gotcha and so like one thing that happened whenever i was transitioning into another school zone mm -hmm. was i stopped hitting every single person up and there was probably a good year where i didn't see a single person yet they were only like three more four miles down the street mm -hmm. so it was like then i got to like see truly who like I added value or they added value to my life, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Friendship's a two way street. It really sucks when you're in like a, a one sided relationship, especially if you like, like the other person, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, Hey, he's a good guy. Like he's fun to hang out with stuff like that. But the relationship's just, uh, it's so one sided, like you're doing all mm -hmm. the work on that. So that's, that's one thing you learned. So after high school, you went to the oil field. Yeah. So, um, Tell, when, tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, the reason that I went through, the reason that I had to go to the oil field was just because, like, some family, like, problems where my family was, like, you know, making it. They were, my parents were feeding a house of six, mm -hmm. sending us to private schools, mm -hmm. and they had multiple cars. They had the brand new iPhones, all, all like, a super nice house, super nice neighborhood. And then my father went into the hospital and didn't like, didn't walk out of there for a hundred and like 60 something days, mm -hmm. went bankrupt with his company, with his law firm and sold it for next to nothing because he couldn't do anything, do any work to pay any bills for it. Mm -hmm. So that happened. And that's when I was like, that's what like, I guess the, what woke me up the most or what I learned the most was that like no one's here to save you no one's here to like help it's like it's like i either you know i eat or i die 
So whenever I got the opportunity, whenever I was just working any and all hours, like during high school, I had a full-time 40-hour job. So whenever I got the opportunity, once I graduated, that's whenever I, I saw somebody in a horrible job, I was like doing septics. Mm -hmm. And I, he got out of jail and then I moved him into my grandmother's house. When I moved him in, into my grandmother's house, he was like making her breakfast, buying her coffee, getting her the, the local newspaper. Mm -hmm. And he was just, you know, wrong person, or he was the right person at the right time to give me an opportunity. He literally gave me one phone call. I got on a phone call, completely lied about my resume. I was like, I can absolutely, <laughs> I can absolutely w weld polypipe. That's totally doable. I know exactly what you're talking about. Had no idea what polypipe was. Didn't know anything about it. I just was like, the the person who got me the phone number uh -huh. just said, just tell me you can pit line. And if he says anything, be like, yep, you can do it. I was like, okay. So I'm just like, yep. He's like, you know how to weld poly? I was like, yep. You ever pit line before? Nope. It's like, okay. Be 6 a.m., you know, in Shawnee, Oklahoma. So I went to a shop in Shawnee, Oklahoma, an hour and 45 minutes away from my house. Uh -huh. Rolled up in a 96 Mercury Cougar to this oil, you know, like this, this, uh, what do you, what do you call it? Just shop. Right. Uh -huh. And, um, he was like, Hey, can you weld those two pipes together? Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, for sure. I went into the bathroom, <laughs> YouTube, <laughs> no. YouTube, the Are nine, you yeah. YouTube, the nine minute video of a, I think it was eight inch, uh, -huh. poly pipe. YouTube did <laughs> learn in eight <laughs> minutes, came back out, Spliced it together. Um, so in, in polypipe, there's like, I don't know how to explain it, but there's there's two pieces. Mm -hmm. And um, there's just this one mechanism that has um, two grips uh -huh. that can hold it. And then you shave both sides and then you have a you have a plate that is heating them, heating them both up at the same time. And they're pressed up against that plate that is like, you know, 500 degrees hot. And you just hot. roll it? Well, or you 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 pull a lever, the poly pipe touches the plate, mm -hmm. and it's getting very 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 hot. Mm -hmm. Once it's like to temperature, then you pull the plate and then you you hard press it together and it it melts it together. Hmm. Yeah, and that pressure um, with that, yeah, and so that's how it's super easy. So so you watch a YouTube video, walk out of the bathroom, your boss is like, okay, show me that you can weld poly pipe, and you're like, mm -hmm. no sweat. And did you nail it? Yeah, like did it, did it, <laughs> I did it like, did it flawlessly, did it exactly what I needed to do. He was like, okay, sweet, you're hired. Um, I think two days later, he was like, yep, yeah, we're sending you to West Texas. So be back at this shop. And this is an hour, 45 minutes away from my house. Uh -huh. Be back at the shop. This was, I think it was Friday or Saturday. Uh -huh. And then he was like, Monday morning we're leaving. So, I get, and he said it was even earlier. So it was like 4.30 or 5 uh -huh. because it's an eight hour drive and we wanted to get there in like halfway middle of the day, whatever. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I go home. I'm like, sweet. And I texted the guy that I, um, that I got the job from. He's like, dude, he told me to be at the shop at 4.30 or 5. Is that good? Quite like, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. He just said, sweet. Okay, we'll see you on Monday. This time I was like, I didn't know he was just like, so you didn't know you were going to go like work in the oil field. You we were just like, I didn't know what I was. Up. Yeah. He just said, um, pack a bag for what? Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. I, um, I went like when I got home, I went and bought steel toe boots, like nicer steel toe boots. Cause right. I was using like Walmart steel toe boots. Right. Cause I like was so frugal. I didn't buy any name brand, anything ever. Yeah. Walmart, Walmart boots are no good. Um, I mean, not no, not once you get out to the oil field. Once you like make good money, then it's like you should spend good money on boots. Sure, sure. It's like you You're should in your boots all day. It yeah. makes sense. Yeah. But um, no, and that, that's how I got out in the oil field. For I was like nineteen or twenty. Um, did a whole summer plus then. Mm -hmm. um, well, I did. I, I did a whole like I think it was like three. 
I think it was three months straight. Mm -hmm. They were just like, well, you did, how much clothes did you bring? Uh, enough for like a while, four or five days. Yeah. And he was like, oh, dude, we're going to be here. This job's going to take two and a half weeks. I was like, okay. I had no place to live at this point. Like, keep that in mind. I was just like, You okay. just packed a bag left and then just yeah. like, here you go, sleep in your cot in the man camp. Yeah. Like, they were either giving me a man camp or a hotel, and I was just like, okay, cool. There like, that's why I, I took the job in the first place. Yeah. Was one, they said I could make good money, but two, they were like, we'll pay for the housing. So I was like, sweet. So how many years were you in the oil field? Um, two and a half to three. Okay. And then what was the reason you left the oil field? What did you do after, after that? Um, obviously you left the oil field, obviously you're not in it anymore, but well, once I left I, in the middle of the oil field, I started like learning, like I was not meant to work my way up this like corporate ladder of, of, you know, hand, right hand foreman, sure. you know, company man, like whatever that could be. And I was always talking to everybody that came on our job sites just mm -hmm. to see what was up because I was like. The, the job that I did was not ideal. Like you don't want to, you don't want to do pit lighting. It's just back breaking labor. Back breaking. Like it was the worst of the worst labor. I was like bottom barrel of the oil field. Just the grunt of the grunts. Yeah. Like, like even like being at the top of pit lining, you were still like the bottom of like the food chain in the oil field. So what did they, what did they have you do? All these move? What did you? My job when I first started was move 2000 sandbags a day. So you just loaded sandbags? How, how heavy Made them, sandbags? moved them. Well, it depends. Depends on if they wanted to buy them for us or if they depends on if they wanted us to make them by hand or if it rained. Yeah. If it rained, double. It was 40 pounds. Right. They were usually like 20-ish pounds or whatever, but it was like 40 pounds of, of like just solid mass. Sure. And so it just depended. And my very first day, I know for a fact his name was Tori, and um, we called the we used it as like a verb, like hey, like you just uh, Toried this or whatever, uh -huh. um, or we would call you Tori if you ever half asked anything. Sure, he got fired the very first day. I started the same day he did too. We drove down, uh -huh. and he wouldn't move two sandbags at a time, and I watched him get fired immediately. Go home. Yeah, they bought him a they bought him a greyhound, and just sent him home. Yeah. Brutal, man. Yeah. So how long were your shifts usually? Truck times at 5 to 6 a.m. Uh -huh. um, if the location was close, but it would be like 4.30 to 5 if it was far away. Uh -huh. um, and then we would get off when the sun went down. But usually we would like start breaking things down. When the sun when went the down. When the sun like right. absolutely So a couple hit. hours after dark too. Y yeah, maybe like an hour. We would, we would prep it best we could. Gotcha. But it was usually like... I would say averagely like 14 to 15 hours. How do they, how much do they pay you out there? It was day rate, so they wouldn't do overtime. Uh -huh. So that was the most messed up thing was if they wanted us to work 18 hours, mm -hmm. they could. So what was your daily rate? Um, 235 to 255. Yeah, that's tough. That's uh. But the the good thing about day rate was you could do the math. Right. And then, like, I, whenever I was out there, I was, like, in frugal mode. Mm -hmm. And I was just trying to make sure that, like, my siblings and my – I was just trying to make any money for myself because I didn't have a place to live at all. Right. <clears throat> didn't have any place to live whenever I was doing this. So if I was working, I knew I had a place to sleep. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would sleep on couches when I went home. Um, so but, you just never wanted to leave the oil field because, like, my bed's here and like, yeah, and I was, I, gotcha. I was, you know, I had 12 to, you know, 18 hours a day of figuring my stuff out, mm -hmm. you know, because when I was not like working with a team or whatever, sure. I had my headphones in and I was in my own world. I was just like, Hey, what trying to figure something out. Right. Right. Because everybody else in my family went to college. Um, literally all five of my you know, immediate family members, they were either in college or going to college. Right. Um, and I was like, well, I'm the only one that didn't go to college. So I was the only one that took this route. So I had like 12 to, you know, 14 hours a day of like 
let's figure something out. Right. And then three months of that, then I started to like get good at my job. Mm -hmm. And then whenever I got good at my job and I was making money, I still like, I think it was a whole year of me bouncing couches mm -hmm. before I decided to ever even like look at renting a room from a buddy. Wow. Now. But it was because I was, I think my first year in the oil field, I, I maybe took off 40 days mm -hmm. for like a year straight, like 40 to 50 days. Like it definitely wasn't. Yeah. Cause in the oil field, it definitely pretty, wasn't two months. Isn't it common for guys to go work a job and then not come back to work for like two, three months and then go back, I guess. Um, what usually it is, is either four weeks on one week off or six weeks on two weeks off. Gotcha. So, and it varies depending on the job that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Obviously this is not offshore. Offshore is like 90 days and you go back or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, or it could be like 120 days or whatever. And then you go back for like a month mm. or two. So it just depends on on what side. But for us, it was if they, well, for us, it was a mom and pop shop. So if, if they like had it overtime mm -hmm. and you weren't like the cream of the crop worker, mm -hmm. you did not get that. You didn't get the extra day. You didn't get the easy day. Like if you weren't the like we fought for our chairs in the in the oil field like or truck seats. Like I remember specifically because I wasn't the man and I wasn't the hardest worker uh, in the mm -hmm. oil field. I specifically remember the crew lead in a man camp in Fort Stockton literally overlook me and look to the right and be like, no, let's go. And like didn't pick me. So I didn't get to work or make any money that day. So uh yeah, dude, the oil field, all the stories that I hear about kids going to the oil field, it's like, to me, it sounds like modern day going to the coal mines to like die. Cause I know a lot of people go out there and they never come back, but you made it out. I mean, obviously you, you yeah. learned that oil wasn't your life's calling and stuff like that. So obviously you're super frugal. You saved up a ton of money from the oil field. Mm -hmm. And then one day you were like, I'm out of here. I'm going to leave and yeah. uh, bought uh, a ticket to, what was your first, like, what would you, obviously you bought a ticket to somewhere, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so how that happened was I had so much time in the oil field because it was just monotonous manual labor. There was no, like, there was very little, um, like, verbal communication. Sure. Because I'm on a location that's 500 by 500 feet. So I'm screaming or using my hands or we're talking. Mm -hmm. And then we walk away, but we know each other's next steps so that I don't have to walk 100 plus feet just to say, hey, what was that again? So we got pretty good at like sign language. Um, but um, I had a, a good six hours by myself every single day. I didn't have to talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking and, and I started like, just like wanting to expand my knowledge of, of everything. Sure. Because I knew that I wasn't gonna be in oil field. So I started getting on YouTube as I got the job. I was like, well, if I can get this kind of job and make, you know, 60 grand a, a year as like 19 and 20 years old. Right. If I can do that, let me see what else is on. So I started learning about real estate, learning about stocks, learning about how to, I learned how to plumb, do plumbing. And then I learned framing. Mm -hmm. and to be honest, I had to, and I did this with another job. I was not handy at all. And I YouTube how to read a tape measure. I, and I was a, a a framer, and I he said, "Do you know how to read a tape measure?" <laughs> You're so, like, no. <laughs> so I was like, "Yeah," and he said, "Go cut that drywall, go put it there." I was like, "Okay." Took me like ten oh my minutes. Gosh. Took me ten minutes to do it. <laughs> YouTube saved your rear end on so many jobs. Yeah. This is hilarious. No, yeah, one hundred percent. And um, so I learned all these things about um these different like career paths uh -huh. off of YouTube and watching people do it. Right. How to build credit. How to you know, uh, tear down credit. Right. Um, so it was like my third, I think I, I might've done like three and a half years, but, mm -hmm. um, it was like my last couple months in the oil field. It was like May. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. And there was like mom and pop shops had like this horrible polit politics and, the um the whole like the whole job was just like 
revolving door of new people. So I was always having to, you know, readjust. Sure. Based on their work habits or whatever. Yeah. Like it was... And it just was like at, by the time I was three and a half years in, mm -hmm. um, however long uh, I was there, there was three owners and then an HR guy mm -hmm. and then uh, my boss. And I was like, I was the fifth guy. I was the fifth most senior guy in the company. Um, that in small? in yeah. three and a half years. But yet we were still doing 50 to $75 million a year. Mm -hmm. um, but I just knew it wasn't for me. And I was like, you know what? I went and talked to the owners. I was like, hey, um, I don't know what I want to do, but this isn't it. And I don't want to drag ass. Sure. Or like let you think that I don't appreciate what this job has done for me the last couple of years. Right. So I'm just telling you now. I'm putting in my notice in August sure. and this was May. So I'm like, Hey, this is months ahead. I don't know where I'm going to be. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to buy a one way ticket. And I had no idea what I was doing. Never been, never been more than to Chicago. Right. And that was the, like the furthest, you know, Chicago and Florida was like me, like getting out there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I bought a one way ticket. Honestly, it was in August. I was like, I was super scared to do it. Mm -hmm. Like terrified. Oh, I'm sure. Like never left the country, got my passport. I, I applied for it in May, I got it in August. And when I got it, I was like, oh, I have literally by now, I have told every single person in my entire life that I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. I have to do this. I had to commit to it. I right. was just like telling the whole, my whole world that I'm going to go on a trip around the world mm -hmm. and I'm going to see what I can do and just experience life and then find out what I really want to do because I wanted to leave the rat race and I was super stagnant and content and, and just, you know, not happy with what I was doing. I was sick of making good money and not having time to spend it. That yeah. was like one of the worst things. I feel like doing that, like out of high school or at a young age, like if you could save up, I mean, 10 to 15 grand and just as a young single 19 20 year old just even travel the world and see like what the world looks like i think it it changes your perspective they do it in other countries too like when i was so you know like obviously i had my mission when i was in bolivia um i i was working in an orphanage one time and we ended up bumping into these they were germans but i talked to one of them and uh she was saying that they it's a normal thing in europe for people to graduate high school and before they even go to college go spend a year working or helping out or doing hum humanitarian work in another country really? because it looks better on their resume so that they can get into their universities and so i think a lot of uh, one of the problems that we have in our country is like it kids don't get enough exposure and they don't have a perspective because yeah. they don't know what other parts of the world because I'll tell you what, living in Bolivia two years made me the most patriotic person in the world because we really do live in like the greatest country in the world. But if you grow up here and you never see anything else, like you don't know. And, you know, people, I feel like complain a lot about their lives or the opportunities that they have yeah, here, they but just... they have no idea how privileged we actually mm -hmm. are just to even live in this country. Because if you think opportunity is scarce here, you think you're oppressed here or anything like that, like, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to desensitize some horrible things that happen in our country on a daily basis, but it's a lot worse in other places and not a little bit like worse. It's, it's really bad. But, um, you know, you, you obviously, where'd you, uh, travel first to? So you bought a plane ticket. So I bought a plane ticket to Ireland. I was like, you know what? Everybody always thinks I'm Irish cause my beard, right? I'll go there. They speak English. So there you go. So, so, so first plane ticket, I'm going to Ireland. And actually I got a killer deal. I got all the way to Ireland for $300. There you go. I was just like, yes. And I still, it did not hit me until 10 to 11 days I was in Ireland. So you land, so you land in Ireland and I mean, the world's your oyster. You had no plans. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, actually so like, so I land in Ireland they think I am a, like, they think I'm skipping town and they're like, we don't want to let you in. No way. Cause, yes. Cause you didn't have any plans, or itineraries nothing, or nothing. Nothing. I didn't have a hotel booked for the night. And so they're like, <laughs> do you have any travel plans? You're like, not a single one. And they're like, Ooh, what's going on? Yeah, like, yeah. that's pretty, pretty, you know, sketch. I was like, what's, what's wrong? They were like, well, we don't know if you're just going to come over here and stay. I was like, no, nah, I've got like a whole 
whole world to see. I've got like a whole year. Yeah, I've saved up, uh, you know, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Right. I'm here to do some stuff. I don't think I like it that much yet. And so far, it's been five minutes in the country, and I'm getting you know hassled. Yeah. So maybe and I don't you're, even want to. You're 20 be years here. old, no life experience, nothing. Yeah, just, I, I was yeah, 21, yeah. and uh, at that point, I'm like, or no, I, I was 22. I was 22. So yeah, yeah. And at that point, I'm like, what is this guy's deal? Is this going to be the whole trip? Am I going to like, am I like in for this rude awakening of like, it's not as easy as it sounds. Mm -hmm. um, and so he went through my, he like the TSA had to go through or, or whatever airport security. Um, they went through my documents. They went through my wallet. They went through my bank accounts. They went through my photos. They went through my um, emails. They went through my text messages. They went through everything on my phone. It wasn't like a little process. It was like 30 minutes. Zero, and 30, they're, they're looking for, minutes. for some sort of plan or connection to Ireland. Yeah. Nothing. They and think I'm like, they, yeah, they think I'm just gonna, they think I'm just gonna post up, start working there. And I'm just like, dude, I've got to be in, you know, the UK right. in, in like, I don't know, like a month. Yeah. They're like, well, how do we know? Because I don't want to be here. I wanted to go to a beach too. <laughs> like, and I just, I'm just trying to plead my case. That's so funny. And, he, and he's trying to tell me this is how the world is. And I'm just like. No, it's not like. Um, I don't recall any of this whenever I was Reddit, you know, searching how to travel, like yeah. solo travel. Right. You know? Uh, and he was like, he was like, no, like you have to have like itineraries. Like I was just like. Yeah, so, they do like they do like to to see that you have at least like yeah, some sort and of plan. So he actually made me right then and there buy a one uh, one way ticket out of the country. Oh no, that's how that's how it had to happen. So I wasn't allowed in the country right. without a plane ticket out. Yeah, they just have to have proof that you're going to leave. Yeah. Did you have to do that for every country you went to? No, or? that was the only one. Gotcha. Nobody else cared. So you went from Ireland. Not one. So you get in the country first night, uh, just hostile it and. I, uh, yeah, it, funny enough, um, the, the hostel that I went to uh -huh. was in no relation or like no correlation. I didn't mean to do this. It was connected to the Bow Street Jameson Distillery, the original Jameson, Jameson. Distillery. That's awesome. And that's why I flew there. Literally, uh -huh. I was like, you know what? I love whiskey and I love beer. Let me just go check out Ireland. And they speak English. Let me get my heebie-jeebies of travel. I've never left the country in my right, life. Right, right. Get the wheels out. Yeah. And I go there and I was like, oh, shoot, this guy is like on my case. I don't know if I can get in the country. Boom. Um, I don't know what it was called, but hostel had a bar in it mm -hmm. and it looked pretty chill and looked super clean and nice. And it was $47 a night mm -hmm. for a, a shared dorm or whatever. And then I found out I walked outside, went and took, you know, a hundred feet to my right is like the Jameson distillery factory with these massive, you know, green doors mm -hmm. that just say Jameson, you know, in steel. And for you, it might as well have said like, welcome home. I'm yeah. Like, welcome home. Literally. So how long did you spend in Ireland? Um, well, because of that, I had to leave within uh, a couple of days or a week. I think I stayed like 17 days, nice. 16 days. So you flew and then you went to England next, or the mm -hmm. UK next, and then from UK to Amsterdam. Amsterdam to, and how long did you stay in each one of these places typically? Um, two to three weeks. So Amsterdam, and then Amsterdam to Budapest. Budapest. That one was whenever Amsterdam was way more expensive than I thought it would be. Yeah. So as my travel and as much as I could, you know, search, and this was all by the whim, by the way. Like, right. Like, I just was like, you know what? Where's my next place? No I'm, budgeting, no, like. I, I knew how to budget. I knew how to be cheap and frugal because I'd been doing that in the oil field for right, years. Right. Um, like, I would literally go and buy, like, sandwich stuff mm -hmm. in the UK. And sure. I lived on a boat called the Kyle Blue in Bristol. Uh-huh. Um, and I, and it, you, I. You just lived on a boat? Well, no, it was like a, it was like a, it was a hotel. Okay. Boat. okay. It was like a hostel hotel boat. Okay. It was so cool. It was like, um, I don't know, probably had like. 30 beds uh -huh. and it was just floating on the yeah, yeah just parked the, out in the um you know in the bay and uh and just rocked at night and everything like that um yeah it was super nice it was That's so cool. cozy it was one of the like some of the best sleep i've ever gotten interesting 
Um, but it was only two stories. Right. The second story was all glass. Yeah. And I had free coffee and breakfast in the morning. So that's what got me. I was like, I could stay in this party hostel and it sounds horribly loud because I walked by it. Right. And I was like, mm, let me like search, see the better deal because deals online are better mm -hmm. than walking up. And I literally, it's like 2 a.m. in the morning when I get to Bristol and um, I'm like, this sounds like a party, but I'm exhausted after Ireland. I was there for, you know, two and a half, three weeks. Mm -hmm. and I was like, at that point I was like, let me take a, let me dial it back a little bit. Yeah, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me relax. Yeah, I've got, I've got a whole year of this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I go and find Kyle Blue and it's super chill, free breakfast. And that's only like a mile away. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was it was super nice. So then I would do like sandwiches, and I would just literally picnic every day um, in this like quaint little town called Bristol. Um, I had like shopping and window shopping, and had like this Times Square. Yeah, um, that's really cool. So so you went from there to Budapest, and Budapest. Where did your travels take you to next? Um. From Budapest, I went straight to Thailand. So that, I mean, straight from obviously Europe, straight to, you know, Budapest, which is, I guess, on the other side of the main Mediterranean, right? Is Hungary um, on the other side of Mediterranean? No. no. It's, it's right about it. It's right below Germany. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. My geography is not Amsterdam, as good as I thought it was. Yeah, no. So it, go, it goes Holland, Germany. Then, then Prague Hull. is kind of in the, in the same area. Isn't Prague, Austria? Um, yeah, we're horrible yeah. people. We're just gonna cut all this out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah but it, but it, I what I drove through with the bus was it was an overnight bus, uh -huh. and that was another thing. Me being frugal was like, oh, I could sleep on a bus, on bus. for twenty four yeah. hours. Yeah. They do the same thing in South America. Um, so I went from Amsterdam, stopped in Prague mm -hmm. for one hour, um, not even, and then from Prague it went to Budapest. Cool. And then so Budapest and then straight to Thailand and you stayed in Thailand the longest out of every yeah. place? Okay. I stayed in Thailand for three plus months. That's awesome. Um, I had to restamp my visa multiple times. So how did you get into bartending? So you were in obviously Thailand for a few months and then um, how did you score restaurant gigs? Because obviously you got in the oil field like straight out of high school, mm -hmm. right? And then you obviously traveled the world. You love whiskey and beer. Obviously it's, you know, you're you. Yeah. You're, you're kind of well, sort of drinks before, and fine foods, but. Before I took that oil field job while I was waiting for that call pretty mm -hmm. much, I was doing um, serving. I did restaurants and I did um, like a uh, country club. Mm -hmm. So I got into like, I got the feel of like talking higher in to higher end clients and dealing with like very, you know, elegant dining mm -hmm. in a country club. Gotcha. So that was right before the oil field. Okay, I got yeah. you. So in this one span of a year, I was doing restaurant gigs. I was doing banquets. I was doing, um, I was in the back house cooking. So that's really where you learned restaurant biz, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah, that, when that, that was when I was in high school though. Gotcha. So when I was in high school, I was doing all this restaurant 40 hours a week. Sure. Easily. Like I went straight, I ran to the restaurant from school. So total time from, I mean, it makes sense. So that, that puts, I guess that connects the dots next is how you go from Thailand to obviously bartending in Seattle. But um, total time spent outside of the United States traveling six months, eight. Yeah, I think it was like six months. Like six months. Um, what do you think was like the most important lesson that you learned on that whole, or not the most important lesson, but what did you learn on your travels? Because very rarely do people ever just, hey, I'm going to go and be alone for six months not take any friends with me. Obviously, you know, you probably texted or called people back home or people probably hit you up from home, but it's like, I'm just going to go see the world by myself, formulate my own opinions, formulate my own thoughts without outside influence or, you know, propaganda. And, uh, I guess, what did you take away? What was the big, honestly, I, um, I, one of the, the best takeaways from my trip was to not lose yourself in like the rat race mm -hmm. and to just like actually enjoy your time. Yeah. Um, the, the best times that we, I had on my travels were, um, like literally walking with friends, mm -hmm. storytelling and just like, I, I just like have so many stories 
from when we were walking the beach. Sure. We weren't doing anything. Yeah. And then that actually, that storytelling, you know, among friends, mm -hmm. like enjoying ourselves, you know, enjoying our company, we started picking up trash because we were like, do we walk this beach every day? And there's, yeah. there's trash, you know, in the tide. So then we started picking up trash and then it would just like turned into like every day for months on this beach. I just pick walked, up trash and walked back and forth, picked up trash. And then we started getting paid for it through beer. So then they started giving us beer because uh -huh. they were like these were they were like resorts, but they were like, you know, like yeah. smaller time like hotels sure. on the beach waterfront. Sure. Then they would come up and give us beer for it. Yeah, but I mean, that's so interesting that you do that because I would, I mean, if it was me traveling the world uh, by myself, like I would imagine that, you know, I'd be selfish. It's like, I just want to focus on that. But if you're living in a place for a long time and it's like that, that was your way of giving back, which probably enriched the experience that you had on uh, during your travels. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just was, it came from like, just, I don't know, wanting to, wanting more out of my life from like, I'd seen so much in like, you know, a couple months, mm -hmm. right. In like three, four months. And then by three, four months I was, I was exhausted. Yeah. So I picked an Island and I loved it. So I just stayed, I stayed for like, I think a total of like of 80, almost 90 days on this Island. Mm -hmm. And I just was on that Island and I just was like, okay, this is where I'm going to be for a long time. And I didn't know when I was coming back or anything. I got phone calls. Hey, when are you coming back? Whenever I run out of money. Yeah. And I also had an oil field settlement coming in. Right. So then I was like, oh, I get to redo my whole trip. This is like half my budget. Again, I just get that dumped into my bank field, account. What did the oil field owe you after? Like, so, so they got a class action lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Then they just were like, hey, we're going to pay all of our Yeah, like that settlement. mom and pop shop got yeah, yeah. sued because they weren't charging overtime and they knew it. They were doing day rate and then they were making us so work in the long run when they settled with everybody. Did they end up saving money or spending the same amount of money that they oh, would have paid they, over time? Yeah. Do they spend so much more money? I mean, like in, in the settlement, you think? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, they probably spent like a quarter million dollars like over a, but how many, how many employees got paid out on that? 30, 40. They, pr they probably over, I mean, a two year period, they probably saved more money than what they settled for. You think, I mean, what did your check look like? Like 8,000. Oh, so you're like, okay, I can extend my trip another yeah. three, and, four months. And mine was like, mine was like mediocre is what I, what I heard from the grapevine. Right. Mine was mediocre. There was guys that got paid double. Sure. And then there was guys that got paid the same. And then there was guys that got paid like two to 4,000. Hmm. And that's just like, you know, what I heard around, around town. Yeah. From the, the guys. But yeah, so whenever I was there, two, two and a half months in, I got that right when I needed it to. I had like, <laughs> I had next to like, um, I had next to like $5 in my bank account. Wow. I had nothing. That's uh. And I was still. You're supposed to stay out there, man. I was still yeah. waking up, going and getting my banana smoothie, uh -huh. having pad thai at, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning. Sure. Going and swimming in the water and doing whatever, whatever we decided to do, rock climbing, snorkeling, diving, or right. um, ride the mopeds around or do uh, hikes. There was so many hikes. That's awesome. So obviously travels must come to an end sometime. Mm -hmm. So eventually you came back to the United States, moved to Seattle. Um, well, I, that wasn't the plan. Right. I was just gonna go visit my folks. I was like, yo, I just did this trip. I made it, I'm mm -hmm. alive. Sure. So from like, I, I went east, right, mm -hmm. from Oklahoma to, I flew out of uh, Rhode Island and then I went to Ireland. Well, mm -hmm. I kept on going east. So to complete it, I had um, the option to go east or west. I was like, well, let me just like full circle this. Yeah. So I flew from Thailand whenever I was like, yo, um, to my family, I gave them a exactly enough for the most expensive one-way trip mm -hmm. anywhere in the world. I was like, that's $700. Here, family, keep seven hundred dollars. I know I'm gonna spend it if I keep it, so I need you guys to have this. Yeah. So I go and and call them, and I'm like, yo, um, to my father, I'm like, 
do you want to fly me home? He's like, yeah, what's up? And I was just like, uh, yeah, I got like $5 left to my name. And so he was scrambling. He was like, he was like, you know, mm-hmm. I was almost stuck in Thailand mm-hmm. and with not even enough to get, well, I was, I had enough to eat for one day and get a uh, train ride to the, uh, to the, um, the airport. S- ended up spinning it on beer. <laughs> so I had to ask him. Solid, I had to use, solid strategy. I had, I had to use Sound some of strategy. that. Yeah. Ended up, I was like, hey, can you, you know, cash out me a little bit more. I need, I need. Now you're just a freeloader at this point. Yeah, I need, I need a last. Well, the the plane ticket was like five hundred something. I was like, hey, can you just cash out me the rest of that seven hundred? Mm-hmm. Um, because that's what I gave him, and so they gave me that, and then um, I ended up like two a.m. in the morning, getting to there, flying to Taiwan. Um, Taiwan. I don't know Taiwan. It sounds right. Yeah, Taiwan's it's a country. It's not Tijuana because Tijuana is Yeah, Mexico, it's Taiwan. Right? It's Taiwan. Taiwan. Yeah, Taiwan's That nation. place, third, that was one of the most third world I've ever seen. Really? Oh, yeah, it was bad. I had never seen it. Like, Thailand was, like, rough, huh. but that place was shack to shack. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It, that one was wild to see. And I didn't even have to leave the airport, and I could feel it in the air. Wow. The smog in the airport. Yeah. It was just, oh, yeah. Man. There was smog in China. See, people, when I flew people, through. people don't see that. It's like, hey, yeah. airports, which in the United States, like typically they're super clean, super nice. Oh, yeah. Like, right. But marble floors, yeah, whatever. Just, dude, it, what I love about your story is you didn't rush through life like most kids do. Cause like for me, it was like graduate high school, go to college, go on a mission, get married. Uh, when I get back, I'm going to bust through my degree and get my degree. And then I'm going to go to medical school and I'm going to bust through medical school. And then I'm going to go to specialty. And I'm going to bust through specialty. Like I already had the next like 15 years of my life planned out. And I was just trying to hustle through it. And if I kept that same path or that same trajectory, I'd be grinding until I'm about 35 years old and look up and be like, dude, I missed the last 15 years of my life because my head was in a book or my, I don't know, I was, I was working too much. What I love about your story is it's, it's like, hey, like I saved up some money, I gained some money, I'm gonna go get some perspective and spend like some time on myself. And when you get back, it's like, you know, you you easily assimilate back into life with a different perspective, a healthy perspective because oh, yeah. of what you saw. And then, you know, you've been able to build off of success with that. And you're not hustling through life. You're you're twenty six and you've been a lot of places, had a lot of life experience through the travels. I'm just if you're a man, I, I swear, if you're a kid out there and you know, you need to gain some perspective. Take some time to get outside of the country. I think and go see the world. So, yeah. uh, wrap things up in Thailand. Your brother hooks it up. You go to Taiwan. You're in the slums, or you, you just see that it's a really slummy place. So you yeah. just connected. You were there, there for a couple a hours. Yeah, I was, <laughs> um, because I had no cell phone service throughout mm-hmm. this entire journey. So I was like, like. Yeah, yeah, how they did it back in the day before cell phones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so the only type of service I would get is like if I went to a coffee shop and I, I got some Wi-Fi. Huh. Um, I think it's called like shoelace travel is what it was, I was for the most part doing. Sure. Um, where it was like I just had one backpack, obviously. And So on your whole like trip, like how many how many Americans did you run into compared to like people from around the world? Three. Really? Mm-hmm. Four, maybe under five, though. See, for like, sure. I feel like growing up, everybody's like, Yeah, I'm just gonna backpack across Europe. Everybody says that, and I think everybody like desires to have that, but like, when it comes down to it, I, I think, think most more people talk. are too. More people I just think, talk. I think people are scared to. It, it, dude, it'd be scary, yeah. like, leaving just, I don't, I'm gonna go out and see the world at 20 years old, but that's how it used to be. Like, people would just venture out away from their home, away from what's comfortable, and go make it. I, I feel like just, Three. I feel like Oklahoma or Oklahoma. I feel like America, like that's a scary thing. I feel like, like to us traveling so, across the world. So how many know. other, how many other countries of like, or I guess, how many other travelers did you bump into while you were just doing this? Like hundreds, thousands? Hundreds. Yeah, yeah. Hundreds. And they're all from different countries. Yeah. What there, was, what was there, like the main country that somebody was from that you ran into? Um, I saw a lot of Germans. They love to travel. Yeah. And they're amazing. The yeah. German people are awesome. I was so bummed that I skipped Germany on this trip. And then when I met a slew of Germans, then I realized why I, I like, I- You would've just moved there and stayed there? Well, um, 
I realized it was better the way that I did it. Sure. So because of that, you have to think like when you meet, you want to meet the most interesting, mm-hmm. like, f- you know, fun and like outgoing people of that, you know, place, right? Sure. Well, those interesting, outgoing, fun people aren't going to be there. They're going to be traveling. They're well. going to be somewhere else, yeah, right? Yeah. So when I went to, when I went to Amsterdam, mm-hmm. I met like one Dutch person, you know, like. In a, I, in a hostel, it's like. Yeah, yeah like yeah. I met like one person. And then I like, I met like two or three people in the UK, you know, sure. I met a handful, but just not as influential or like, you know, uh, memorable as when I went to Thailand, I met 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 Germans. Sure. Because they were all like, yeah, I don't want to stay in Germany. I want to it's get out. Thing. I want to Dude, meet it, people. I want to see It's a thing. I think world. out of, I think out of any country I've, I've always been impressed with every German that I've ever met speak at all of mm-hmm. them speak English. So they speak German and English. They're really good at speaking English. And then, yeah, they just have, it, it's like they have it all figured out. So yeah, they're, they're it's, very, it's, they're yeah. very well put together. I need to get over there and um, see it. But yeah, just based on the character of people that I meet when I meet them, they're yeah. all put together. They're all calculated people. They're awesome. Yeah. I think they're cool. No, yeah, I definitely like uh, appreciate the German friends that I made over mm-hmm. the trip. There was actually a German uh, scuba uh, um, dive shop. Mm-hmm. It was like they only spoke German. Hmm. So, and then I had, I like so, I had the really cool, authentic, like, I want to get out there and meet people, Germans that I was friends with. Sure. They were like, I don't want to go to that one. Why would I want to hang out with a bunch of Germans when I just left Germany? I didn't fly across the world to meet Germans. Touche. So that's yeah. my thought, too, was I wasn't really looking for the Americans. Yeah. Like, I, sometimes I was because I was like, oh, so homesick. Yeah. Um, so it was like so refreshing to meet a girl from Colorado yeah. or to meet, um, a girl from New Jersey. Sure. Um, I never liked the LA guys that I met, uh, the California guys I did not vibe with at all. Uh-huh. Um, and then one Texas guy was the worst. Um, but other than that, that was like, that, yeah, that was it. There was only like those. A, hand, a handful of people. Yeah. And then the one guy from Florida was a homie. So when you flew back, did you go right back to Tulsa? No, that, no. That so uh, Taiwan to um, Canada, and then my folks were living up in Seattle. Mm-hmm. So that's a two and a half hour drive okay. from, to Vancouver. So you just drove down from? Yeah, it, it's two and a half. I don't know what it was. It was like two and a half to three and a half hours. Sure. Something doable of a drive, for, especially for Midwesterns. Right. Um, so they picked me up. They were like, we're more than happy to come and pick you up. Mm -hmm. It's like, they're like a a drive is just like, I don't know. It's like a treat. It's like driving in Washington. Mm -hmm. You're looking at mountains the entire time. Snow capped mountains the entire time. You're just seeing lakes and like beautiful landscape the whole time. So my fastest, fastest two and a half hour drive you've ever had. Yeah. Well, um, for me, I was just like this, like. So I got picked up and I'm like, whoa, I'm like alive. I made it, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm here. And it didn't hit me until I was allowed back into the States at custom, yeah. the, at the border. Yeah. So from Vancouver there, he went in again on me. I was like, you know what? This only happens whenever I'm leaving the country to go to like my very first time. Sure. And I like almost had like, almost a PTSD because I was like in a room for 45 minutes. What did he have a problem with? Or was it, it was Canadians? It was just Canadians. Oh, okay, and okay. So just, you, you landed at the airport, your parents picked you up in the car and you were like trying to leave the airport. No, no, we were trying to leave um, Canada just across the border to Washington so, State. So the just Canadian the actual, border patrol was like, mm-hmm. what are you doing in our country? You don't have a stamp here. It was like, bro, I just flew in. So yes, gotcha, gotcha. He just wanted to ask 20 questions. It's fine. Yeah. That's what They're it doing was. their job. They're yeah. doing their job. No, border no, no. patrol is not easy. And no, they, yeah. They it, help out that was, yeah. So that's what it was. It was just another 20 questions. Sure. Um, and then at one point in the conversation, I was like, I can see America. Uh-huh. I'm looking at America. And I just like drop my guard. I'm like, that's how answer the questions. Yeah. And he could just see, I feel like he could see because my dad could see um, the like the relief 
that I was literally on America's doorstep. I was just right there. So whenever I, I felt this overwhelming like emotion. Sure. Um, and it like, it gets me emotional now talking about it because it just was so, it was so heavy. It was yeah. just like, I had just done this, like exactly what I said I was gonna do mm -hmm. for six months. And I was like, I've done it. I have made it. Sure. I'm just right here. And I'm just right at that corner. And um, eventually he let me in. And I just like, I sunk into that seat and just like, just melted. I was like, oh. Sigh it's, of relief. Like, yeah. back home. It was, yeah, one of the greatest like feelings ever was like finally coming home. I was like, oh, this is like the land that I know. I've felt that before. Like, after going to Bolivia for like two years I remember the first time the plane we, we connected from like so we were in Cochabamba and we flew to La Paz and we stayed the night in La Paz and then we woke up the next morning and flew from like La Paz connected to Miami but like you know you're thinking about the last like two years or like whatever your life was for you know such a long time and then I remember like when the plane took off I was like crying because you know I was like I was saying goodbye to like such a big part of my life and then when we landed in Miami, I just remember the plane landed and American Airlines put like a, who sings the, who sings the, all the other kids with the pumped up kids, better run, better run. Foster the people. Foster the people. Okay. So like there was like a foster the people song that just came on like in the airplane. And I just remember like thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm back in America. Like we're playing like pop music in, yeah. you know, uh, like a, in an airplane and I just remember thinking that same feeling. It was like, it's good to be back. Like it's good to be on home soil, which is so weird, right? That you feel that way about your country, but so yeah. like, I'm very proud to be an American. And I, Absolutely. you know, like when I go to foreign countries and stuff like that, and people ask where I'm from, it's like, I know a lot of people have like negative feelings towards American, but it's like, nah, dude, like I'm, I'm proud of that. It's, it's cool. And it's not that I agree with like our government or anything like that. It's, you know, there's a lot of things that I don't like, but, and there's a lot of things that I think are wrong socially and in our society, but you know, to be here, to live the life, to have the opportunities we have is just incredible. I, so I think people in outside of America looking mm -hmm. to Americans, I think that they, they love us. Mm -hmm. I think they personally, when they speak about the people that they do know, sure. I think they love us. If they get to know you, right. If but just like the us. stigmas, like the Americans stigmas, are hosts. Yeah, yeah. 100%, the stigmas are bad. Sure. But what was funny about this was right before I took this, right before I took, um, oh no, it was it was before I took this trip. I was in visiting in Seattle like mm -hmm. months prior, like around May, mm -hmm. um, you know, three months before I even bought the ticket. Um, when I told some people in Seattle about it, they said, "Oh, tell them you're Canadian," and I just got this this. I was so you're pissed. Like, no, you're like, no. I was like, I was like, dude, are you kidding me? And he, he apparently traveled, but this guy was telling me, he's like, don't tell him you're American. They won't like you. And I was like, that's the most un-American thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Hide your, you know, yeah, hide your identity. Hide. Yeah. Actually, hide. that sounds like the most American thing I've ever heard is like, Hey, like you're from America. Hide who you are. Like no other person would say that. Yeah. It's like everybody's proud of the country they're from. Like, there's no reason you should be ashamed to be, you know, American. I love how this like podcast has turned low key patriotic, but <laughs> it is. So uh, obviously, we got to move on with your story. But um, you go to Seattle, you get a bartending job. Yeah, I walk in, in. I walk into a, a good restaurant my dad recommended, and mm -hmm. I was actively looking, mm -hmm. but I didn't know like the direction. Sure. And then I kind of like just was just like, I gave it a week of hard searching. Mm -hmm. A hard, like every single day I went to restaurant to restaurant to restaurant. I probably, I probably did 40 restaurants. In so that you week. just ate at a bunch of different restaurants? No, no, that, you, this is me applying. Oh, wow. I was applying, I probably applied. You didn't want to be a server, you want to be a bartender. No, no, I, anything. Really? Anything, because up there they pay 17 an hour. Oh, nice. No, regardless of what position you work. So it didn't matter to me. And I was like, that's only $3 less than my oil field. And I get to stand in a nice restaurant yeah. in, in a beautiful city. Sure. sure. You know, like I don't have to scrub oil off my off my hands and I don't have to like clean my ears from the dirt. Yeah. You know, um, of the oil field. So a week of hard search, I'm just like, whatever. Hey, dad, um, 
the settlement money was in. I was like, let's go out. Like, let's go out. Thanks for, you know, doing everything you're doing or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so I took him to dinner at a place that he really liked, just overcasting like Seattle's skyline mm -hmm. on the water. It was gorgeous. And it was a super good, I can't remember the name of it, but it was a great seafood um, place. Mm -hmm. And um, then I just like, at that point, I kind of have given up. And when I gave up, I just kind of went back to like my whole like, um, you know, personality or, or who I was like when I was traveling. Sure. When you're traveling, you just talk to everyone that's American or everybody that can, you know, understand you. Mm -hmm. So I just started talking to the server and just, you know, appreciate this, appreciate that or whatever. Well, he, um, uh, I just, we started talking and then he was like, oh, like you're looking for like a bartending and serving job. I 100% have a job for you. I work three jobs. I said, what? He was like, yeah, I'm a translator for, um, I don't know what it was, but he was like, um, I'm, I translate Spanish mm -hmm. for this company. And then I work this um, bartending job. And then I'm also a server in Bellevue, which is just a, a just on the other side of the lake. Sure. And on, he was like, we need people. It's about to be the busiest season, um, uh, the busy time, you know, sure. busiest time of the year. So I walk in, he's like, you haven't had any experience in like three to four years. It's like, nope. But I, I wore blacked out, you know, everything. I was like, I can work today. And he was like, okay, we'll start you out as a host. And within an hour and a half, I was. You running. didn't have to YouTube at this time. No, yeah, no. I knew. I I figured out what I could do. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't have to YouTube this one. But he he hired me and was like, "Okay, we'll see how you do. We'll start you out as a host." Within an hour and a half, I was running tables. Uh huh. Um, all the food did tables. I ran food all night for four or five hundred guests because this is like a, I think it maxes out at like just the main dining hall uh -huh. is three. 20 really the bar was 50. that's a huge restaurant the bar was 50 and then the banquet hall was 200 wow the banquet hall was closed how many square feet was that building um i don't know but i would as i know the rent of the building was thirty thousand a month so super nice restaurant yeah um it definitely like uh was a staple too in in seattle, seattle. because it came from portland gotcha so it was just one city away of like mm. yo this is and it'd been there since the 90s okay so I'd been there for a long time, like it was established. People were regulars for sure. Sure. And the very next day, um, he was like, Elliot, I need you as a server and I need you to do a banquet. So people are asking me, like I'm serving, I'm doing this like Christmas party or it wasn't a Christmas party. I think it was like an office party or something like that. Um, it was an office party <clears throat> for some, some, um, you know, tech company. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it was, but some tech company office had like 40 plus people. Mm -hmm. And they were like asking me questions and they were like, how is this? How is this? Whatever on the menu. I was like, honestly, I haven't tried that yet. <laughs> it's only my second day. And they were like, Oh, it's only like your second banquet. I was like, no, like I started yesterday. I got hired yesterday. And um, so I was doing banquets my second day. And then I was running, serving, I was serving mm -hmm. up from, I think this was like November. Mm -hmm. Can't remember when this was, but it was like November ish. Okay. And within like two weeks, yeah, within two weeks of running, um, serving and banquets after like the first day I got bumped up to a server, mm -hmm. um, I was making incredible money, 17 an hour plus three, $400 every shift. Mm -hmm. So anywhere you go, that's good money. Sure. And um, I had some beef with the um, the bartender and she just was like, this is a higher end place. Like I wore a tie every, I wore a tie clip. I never rolled my sleeves up ever. Like this was that kind of restaurant. Right. Um, and she just came in looking just like she just woke up. Like, and she just looked pissed off and she would walk in this high-end restaurant, but she'd walk with her shoulders like 
out and like she was like mad at the world trying about to punch somebody and just hated her job or something or yeah i don't yeah, yeah attitude. just uh oh yeah not a great person to work with well we go back and forth of like arguing uh -huh. over like my drinks not coming out quick enough for my tables sure and at this point i'm like two weeks in i'm like saving shifts left and right right i've already you're been, just you're just trying to add as most like the most value you can to the business owner because yeah. he gave you a shot and you're like oh i'm gonna blow you out of the water oh yeah and this guy's name was tyler and he hooked <laughs> it up all the time i was getting free food mm -hmm. he was like dude you're a beast yeah you're working 14 hour shifts you're open to close yeah you you've worked i was working like 60 70 hours in the restaurant a mm -hmm. week in the first two weeks i was like i'm just ready to get back to work whatever you know yeah. i had six months i was like good i was fine well um i started getting an at getting an attitude with her and she's like you know what if you think you can do better get behind here and she starts cussing and screaming and um is she this, walks out and quits is this while the restaurant's going yeah so she starts cussing, screaming, making a commotion. Everybody's looking over like, what the heck? Is this during a banquet? No, it's just a just open open night. hours. But it was packed. It was 5 o'clock. So, and this is snow. This is um, right before we have like um, parades up and down the street every sure. day. So it was amping up. So she me. just yelled, screamed, and quit, walked out beginning of the night. Yeah. If you could, if you think you can do it better, then you come and do it. And she walked. I'm not putting up with this BS, whatever. She just, I remember her screaming to me yeah. about that. And um, the next day, I got hired as the bartender. <laughs> Literally, um, so I, I took her job. <laughs> Did you YouTube it then? Uh -uh. They're like, "Hey, just man the bar." You're like, "Actually, I, I kind of did YouTube it." I, I mean, for I some YouTube. mixology and stuff mm -hmm. like that, like you got to know some common stuff. It was a it was a martini bar, so it's Super vodka simple. ice shake. That's yeah. it. They and and up there they drink so. They were not like vermouth was not a thing. Sure, like at at a point they were just like um, vermouth cuts the liquor, so uh -huh. it doesn't. It's not as like you know stinging or you know sharp. Right, right. Um, so it cuts it to dull it just a little bit, so you get more flavor than you know mm -hmm. than front taste. And they were at this point they were just like, dude, this is a martini bar. Like, don't make it with vermouth, ice, liquor. That's all you need. If they ask for an olive, give it. Yeah. So it was it was pretty cut and dry. Like I and I'm not even to this day. Like I would never say I'm like a great bartender. I just can make classic cocktails, and and do it in an efficient manner. Sure. Um, but yeah, so I took that position, and um, then instead of just making three four hundred, I was getting paid out by all of the servers. So all the servers came up and tipped. So and I got 2% of every liquor sold in the uh, restaurant out of my checks. So I was making like four to 500 easy every yeah. shift. Wow. And on good days, on good days, I was making mo more than 500. So were you clearing like three to four grand a week? Um, something like something close to that. That's like, awesome. What I like about honestly, like just hearing your story more in depth, it just, this is a life hack for kids or just people that want to like have an amazing career. Obviously you have no college degree or anything like that, no formal sort of school after high school, but what you've done is actually pretty, uh, it, it's pretty rare to find, or I don't know if it's rare to find, but these people get snatched up by companies all the time. It's people when they first get hired, they add as much value as they possibly can to their employer in a short amount of time like if i ever got a job i made sure i was busting ass from day one so that my employer could see like yo this guy busts ass and he, he takes his job seriously and you get that good first impression and when employers like you like obviously they want to promote you they want to keep you around they want to incentivize to keep you around and so you know it it, it doesn't matter what kind of job you're in if mm -hmm. you just put a little bit of initiative and fix the impression that people have about you or like work on yourself and then be that ideal team player at work. I think that that is one of uh, life's most important lessons. You make yourself valuable at work. People will pay you and keep you around and no, promote you and, and stuff like that. But I don't, I feel like everybody feels like they're entitled to promotions or entitled to, to things like that. But also like we're not in the rat race too. Like we have the type of job that we get to earn what we yeah, we eat what we kill. So I'm one hundred percent. So you go from bartending, you're making amazing money bartending. Um, 
uh, yeah. So you just had your buddy hit you up and was like, yo, come do this job. And yeah, obviously out, out you're making, you're making good money in Seattle. You've traveled the world, mm -hmm. you know, you're living a really good life for 20, 22, you said 24. I was 23, 23. Yeah. For somebody 23, you're probably pulling in more than six figures working at the bar. If you worked mm -hmm. an entire year and you're in, you know, Seattle, which is a cool place to grow, like to, to live in oh, general. Yeah. So it's amazing. So you quality get the, of life is top tier in Seattle. Yeah. So you, you get the call from a friend that's trying to recruit you to come work pest control and sell door to door. Like, tell us about that. Um, well actually, and they can cut this, but, um, I got the call for eco shield when I was in Thailand on a beach at 2 AM. Sure. Because here in, um, central time, it's 2 PM. Yeah. So, um, my buddy in the oil field thinking nothing of it, mm -hmm. 2 p.m. Let's just FaceTime Elliot. Let's see what's going on. Sure. And I'm in a club, VIP, like on the beach. There's fire spinners in mm -hmm. my face. And I'm like in a roped off section with all of my friends that I've been traveling with. And we're having a great time. We're just a casual, I think this is like a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, and he, so he's like, dude, call me tomorrow. I was like, okay. So I, I have to wake up a little early to call him to make sure that we're not, I'm not calling him at 2 a.m. Sure, sure. So I call him, he gives me a five minute rundown of this job. At that point, I'm not even in work mode. I don't hear what he says. Sure. I just hear he's doing a lot better than what he was in the oil field. Mm -hmm. And he had direction and he had focus. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I'll hear more about it. Uh, fast forward to Seattle when I'm bartending. Sure. Um, he calls me right as I get that job. He's like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, bartending in Seattle. And I'm like, um, he's like, are you, so let me talk to you about this. Let me like do more. I was like, okay, what's up? Five minutes, another five minutes. So like at a total of like 10, 15 minutes tops, I've heard about this job. Again, I barely understand what he's talking about. Right. I barely, I don't know what he's trying to, pedal to me. I don't know how I don't know this, but keep going. I, I just five, 10 minutes. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, pest control? What? What is pest control? I don't right. know what pest control right. is. I'm like, is this like, is he going to like move me into some like shady, like he's saying like not a man camp, but that sounds like he's going to put me in a man camp, Yeah, yeah. you know, um, in some trailers in Houston, Texas. I don't know what Houston, Texas looks like. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to go door to door and I'm thinking magazines. I'm just like, yeah, like just thinking I'm like carrying cans yeah, of bug spray, magazines, like cans magazines, of raid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let me show you pictures of what I'm selling kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. And I'm like, but what he told me in the like the very little he just sent me. Um, he sent me like a short video, I think, of like the cruise or something like sure. that, that uh, Garrett yeah, put yeah. together. And I was like, this I don't know if it's legit. It looks pretty legit. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't like even sold. And then I didn't know anything about the job. He's like, sign this DocuSign. And I was like, well, he said I would take a pay cut. He said, from the oil field, you will make, you could make that in five months here. I said, oh, I can make 60 grand in five months. Bet. But I'm going to take a pay cut from my Seattle job. Sure. And I was like, I mean, I loved my life in Seattle. It was so much fun. Yeah, it sounds I, legit. I mean, it, it sounds was, really fun. Yeah, it was It was amazing. The qual My quality of life has never been higher than it was in Seattle. I'm sorry. Sorry and, to disappoint you. <laughs> well, it, it, at that point in my sure, life. Sure, sure, at the point. So, and, and I knew I was never going back to the oil field. Uh -huh. And he said, I promise you. Do this job one time and you'll never have to go back to the oil field. And I was like, okay. I, I just I knew with what he said in five minutes on a Zoom call. Sure. I was he was turned around, he was focused, and he was, you know, dialed in. Right. So I was like, okay. I signed it. I told my folks, they're like, this sounds like a scam. Everybody sounds yeah, sketchy. It, yep. It's like, who is this good, guy? Good parents. What say is that. he selling? Yeah. What is going on? Yeah. Well, I sign it. I don't even check what he I'm signing. I'm just like blah 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 blah. Um, at I, I just put all my info in, um, and he's like, "Okay, we'll see you in April." It's like sweet, good deal. He called me 
every two months uh -huh. just to say what's up. I'm like, dude, just had this like crazy, you know, table. I had this banquet. I did eBay's banquet. Uh -huh. um, they gave me their credit card for eBay on a sticky note. It was so cool. $4,000 for like 13 people. Uh -huh. Never done that before. You know, everybody got like $100 shots. Right. Like you're just living it 13. up. Like you're loving it. And see, yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, I'm getting more in depth into my thing. Or whatever. And yeah. And I'm just having more fun because I'm really getting to mm -hmm. learn it. And then I have gym memberships and I'm hiking, running, skiing. And I got into skiing when I was up there. That was awesome. And I was 45 minutes from the ski slopes. Sure. But I'm, I look at the needle mm. in my, my bedroom uh, window was the needle. That's so sick. it's like I'm downtown Seattle, but I'm 45 minutes away from a slope at any time. So I'm I'm like, I know how to get around Seattle. Yeah. And I know how to live Seattle yeah. life. Um, COVID hit and it's a panic in Seattle. It hit Seattle and 400 people are dead within the week. Wow. It hit waves of nursing homes. It hit waves of people. And the pandemic was I mean, really messing up Seattle. Wow. People were, I mean, immediately within the first couple of days, no cash was allowed. This was like instant. Like we were across, I actually lived, I lived across the street mm -hmm. from where they were um, testing and trying to create a, um, um, what's the word? A vaccine. A vaccine. Yeah. I'm across the street from all these bio labs, right? And we're just like, you know, they were saying like wear gloves and, and masks. And so we were, we were not touching anything. Yeah. And that was two weeks within that, uh, two weeks from that time, I was supposed to um, buy a plane ticket and it was like three weeks out from April, right? right. Middle of March. And uh, yeah, this is when everything was spiraling downward. Yeah. February, and so this March. was like mid March that this is happening. And for two weeks, I had my schedule 60 hours, you know, cause I'm yeah. the only one that I can do that. Everybody else is, you know, just they weren't having the manpower that this restaurant needed. Mm -hmm. Whenever I walked in, I just was that person to do it. Right. So I'm collecting my 60 hours, I'm getting paid. So now I'm at this point, I'm like, I have broken down every single piece of this bar, whatever, um, cleaned it head to toe. I mean, I've dusted everything a hundred times. Mm -hmm. Like at this point I'm, I'm instead of making, you know, four or 500 a night, whatever it may mm -hmm. be, um, I went to making like 150 to 200. And it. That was just because the people didn't come in anymore. Cut in half because yeah. Seattle got hit really, really hard. Well, um, midway through March, I still had two weeks of work left to, to do. Sure. I knew the bartenders were single moms and she was working two jobs and mm -hmm. I knew a teacher was the server and I knew she could bartend. And at this point there wasn't enough hours. So I was really cool with them and they had just like, kind of like been there for me whenever I just, you know, they were just like, Hey, he works, he takes my shifts all the time. So I just scratched their back enough and, you know, been myself, you know, been good people to them that, uh, or they were good people enough to me mm -hmm. whenever I was trying to learn the ropes. So I was like, you know what, uh, Tyler, I'll just book it out of here, dude. Like, I'll just make today my last day. He was like, yeah, because he was he was like stressed. He was like, I don't know how to give everybody hours. And you're like, I was out. at this point, I was sitting in, in the, you know, the restaurant had a full chef, mm -hmm. big restaurant, right? Full chef. And at this point, I'm just having my lunch with the, the GM, right? Like every day and we're hanging out and we're like getting buddy buddy at this point because i'm spending so many hours i'm there just as much as he is right you live in there and um and he was like dude i don't know we're eating lunch and he's like i don't know if i'm gonna like who's gotta go like dude we're we're scraping by and i was like dude i'm good i saved up all of that money i was frugal the only thing i had expense wise was um was making sure that uh you know i saved up enough to to spend it the right way mm -hmm. and i um i was like dude i'm good i've got you know tons of reserve because i wasn't i didn't have a car i didn't have any expenses i didn't know a lot of people so i wasn't doing a lot uh, my things were hiking and skiing it's right cheap. It's right almost free so so pandemic hits you tell tyler you're like hey man i love you i got cash i'm out you yeah a plane ticket to houston and you just fly out in april um 
I go to Tulsa, I say what's up for three days, mm -hmm. and then I get a phone call um, saying if I don't get there tonight, I won't have that bed. So I'm like, okay, my week that I was supposed to have in Tulsa, the very first time that I had been home mm -hmm. um, since my travels, I'm like, okay, I'm gone in three days. So I, I pack up my stuff and I, I book it too. I grab my car for my brother who I left it with. Yeah. And I grab my TV. Somehow I got it in there. Mm -hmm. um, and I booked it down to, um, to Houston and then pandemic hit. There you go. So I met you. I met everybody. I didn't know anybody. Yeah. I didn't even know anything, the depths of this job. Right. On the, the plane from. You from, YouTubed it again. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I, I mean, in a sense, I basically just got on pick apart your pitch. Oh my gosh. And I was like, I never ran the manual. Didn't know what that was. I didn't know we had one. Yeah. So you just watched training videos and we're I like, just oh, just watch these on the plane ride there and just, you so know, figure it out. So from Seattle oh to Tulsa, gosh. I watched that. And then I got hired on and then I'm like, oh wait, this is a price sheet. This is a script. This is a manual. And you saw me April, March and April and May. I walked around with those three things yeah. in my pocket yeah. all day long. I didn't go to a restaurant. I didn't go anywhere without that manual yeah. or the price sheet. Uh, yeah, dude, I remember, you know, you walking around with your manual and everything like that, like just devouring all the information, you know, uh, we didn't work obviously for that first month during COVID cause we didn't know if we'd be able to knock doors that year, but, um, and you know, you've had a, an extremely successful career, like it, your first year you sold 400 K uh, just 346, 346, which at the time was like one of the highest that any rookie had ever done in company history. You know, it's funny that you just hopped on the training videos and watched them on the way down to Houston. But, um, you know, you, you've had that, that rookie year, you know, and then obviously you wanted to come back and then your second year you, you know, built a team and, and managed a team and, you know, was able to qualify for the partnership program that we have. And, you know, you're, you're one of the youngest partners to do it in, you know, Eagle Shield history. And I just love your story, dude. Like I love where you come from and everything like that. If you could give the viewers or the listeners, you know, one bit of advice with all your life experience with you, you know, doing pest control and now building, you know, an entrepreneurial empire that you, you have, what did your team sell last year? Just under five million. Yeah, yeah, and it's your fourth year in pest control, it's, which is insane. Um, with all your experience, you know, and and everything, like, what what's the big takeaway? What advice do you have for viewers that are on the come up or or wanting to to um, figure their life out and change and on, be successful? Honestly, yeah, um, honestly, like my advice would just be get out there, mm -hmm. get away from your hometown, like see what it's like to travel and to be uncomfortable. Take, take the job that you think would be hard. Yeah. You know, like I knew the oil field job would be hard. I knew that like being a bartender in a big city would be hard. And I, I knew like, I knew that there was risk, yeah. but it was like, I just, um, yeah, I just thought that like, like w what am I gonna do? Mm -hmm. Like turn around? Yeah. Like I, I'm, I need to go forward. I need to like move on. like. You know, you master your craft and you move on, mm -hmm. right? And I, I'm nowhere near mastering this craft, right. but I think I've gotten pretty good at it. Um, but, and it led me to this, but if I had never like pushed for the hard and I'd never, um, if I'd never like wanted more and got out there and, and just traveled and took the risk, I, I wouldn't be like where I am today. And like, I mean, like, like EcoShield is like, I, I'll be here forever. Yeah. Like, I'm, so what's the greatest thing? What's the end goal for you? Where, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Like what is, what is Elliot going to accomplish and what, what are you going to look like in 10 years? Um, other than EcoShield, cause I'll still be here. Yeah. Like more EcoShield. <laughs> um, but no, I mean like in 10 years, like I can see myself having, you know, businesses and restaurants and, and real estate. Yeah. And that's all ran, you know, passively. Yeah. And just like, like in 10 years, I can see having real wealth. Yeah. Like I may, I might make good money, uh, great money at EcoShield, but in ten years, I know that I will have real wealth, generational wealth, is yeah. possible in ten years. That's awesome. Well, guys, you heard it here, uh, Elliot. In my opinion, like you're on the come up. You're in ten years. I'm excited to see where you go. Like if you guys live in Oklahoma, remember the name Elliot Calicote. 
live in Tulsa, like the man's going to own the place one day, which would be sweet. So I'm excited for you, brother. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for filling in too. Like, yeah, I enjoyed the stories. This no, was this, a super fun one. For, this was fun. All righty. Well, we're done. Boom. <laughs>